Tonight I represent over 78 countries serving as the chairman of the International Third World East Association and that gives me the privilege of serving people who are in other cultures and one of the things that I passionately carry in my heart is to help people develop their leadership ability and to discover their purpose in life. And one of the things that I've been pursuing for the past 32 years is to understand the mind of God. The mind of God is more important than the hands of God. The hands of God deal with His acts, but the mind of God deals with His ways. Moses knew the ways of God, the people knew the acts of God, and so those who know the acts of God very rarely have a relationship with God. But those who know the ways of God, the mind of God, there's an intimacy involved there that develops, that creates a credibility with God that only heaven knows. And Moses had that credibility. And as I pursue to understand this issue of purpose, I discovered that purpose is the most important thing in life. I believe the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but the greatest tragedy in life is life without a purpose. It's more tragic to be alive and not know why than to be dead and not know life. And in the book of Proverbs chapter 19 verse 21 is a simple statement that changed my life over 29 years ago. And I read that statement for you. Proverbs 19 verse 21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that will prevail. I'm going to quote that again for you. You can write it down if you wish. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that will prevail. The King James Version says, Many are the devices in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's counsel that will stand. In other words, God is more concerned about His purpose than He is about your plans. I'm going to quote it just one more time. Listen carefully. Many are the plans in a man's heart, God says, but my purpose for that man will prevail. In other words, purpose is more important to God than all the plans you can make for your life. And God has a purpose for everything. And the word purpose is defined in the Hebrew text as original intent or the will of a mind. Purpose means the original reason why something was created. Purpose means the motivation that started creation. Purpose has to do with the reason for existence. Why something exists is called its purpose. And I've been plagued with this question for all my life. What's the purpose for this? What's the purpose for that? Because I understand that if you don't know why you do something, you will abuse it. If you don't know why you have something, you'll abuse it. That includes your own life. I want to share with you briefly on one of the most important discoveries I've ever discovered in my life. A discovery that has changed the course of the way I live every day. One of the greatest and yet most simple truths in the Word of God. I want to share with you on the topic, the purpose for prayer. Write it down please. The purpose for prayer. No matter how big your church is, I want to measure it by the size of your prayer meetings. On Sunday mornings, everybody's in church, but the smallest meeting in every church is the prayer meeting. Right now, tonight, in the Bahamas, I just left there a few hours ago, I am pleased to announce that tonight, one of our largest meetings in our church is our prayer meetings. Hundreds of people gather every Monday night, they're praying right now for us, not too far from here in the Bahamas. It wasn't always like that. I've gone to churches with 5,000 people, and then on Tuesday nights, a prayer meeting, just 100 people. And most of them are old people, who come because they got nothing else to do. 
I'm going to say some things tonight to shake you up, but who cares? There is no place in the Bible where you can never find a ministry of intercession. I've read this book 32 times. I can't find it anywhere where God created a ministry of intercession. It doesn't exist in the Bible. There are people who interceded, but there's no ministry of intercession. Why am I saying that? Because you got people who go to churches with 500, 1,000, 10,000 people, and then they leave the prayer night to a few old people. And they call them intercessors. Well, according to the Word of God, everybody's supposed to pray without ceasing. And my question is, why are the people in the church afraid of prayer meetings? Why don't they go? I figured it out years ago because I stopped going myself. Why don't people pray? Because they don't get results. We pretend to get them. If prayer works so well, why are we not in prayer meeting? Prayer meetings have become an experience of depression for most people. We go to prayer meetings and we spend hours there and in the end nothing happens. So we stop going after a while. Don't be depressed yet. I'm going to help you. But let's deal with some facts first. We love to sing. We love to worship. We love to be present when everyone else is at a worship service. But prayer meetings, we just can't find time for them. And then there's the personal prayer life. You know, most of us have in our homes what they call cookbooks. Anybody got a cookbook in their home? Yeah, my wife got a few. Cookbooks are amazing books. We never use them. And every time we see a new one, we buy it. And it stacks up on the shelf in the kitchen with the others. Anybody know I'm spelling the truth here? We don't use cookbooks, but we love them. Matter of fact, we love the pictures. But we don't use them. And that's what prayer books are for most people. They buy prayer books, but they never pray. What a tragedy. Why don't we pray? Matthew chapter 6 verse 5 is a statement made by Jesus in reference to prayer. Jesus said, and when you pray, that's enough. He didn't say if you pray, but when you pray, he's speaking to his disciples. He says, when you pray, when implies you will do this. I expect you to do this and it's natural to do this. You will do this. In other words, prayer according to Christ our Lord is not a choice. It's not an option for if you believe, he says, then you will do this thing called prayer. When you pray. Every believer knows they should pray. The smallest gathering in every church is still the prayer meeting. Because prayer is considered as the role of a few intercessors. Prayer books are like recipe books. We read them and then we don't act. But I have some questions about prayer that bothered me for years. Some questions that may shock you. Number one, if God is sovereign, why pray? I want you to think about that for a minute. If God is sovereign, then why should we pray? And that's a good question. If God is sovereign, it means that God can do anything He wants to do. So why should we pray if God is sovereign anyhow? He's going to do what He feels like doing anyhow. So why pray? It's a good question. Second question, if God is not influenced by us, then why pray? 
sovereignty actually means that he is free from your influence. Then why should we pray? If I pray for God to do something and he's sovereign, he could do the opposite. So why should I waste my time appealing and appeasing and, a, and petitioning a God who will do what he feels like anyhow? It's a legitimate and logical question. Third question that bothered me. If God cannot be affected by what we say, he is God, then why pray? I got the answers and it changed my life. I will give you three answers that changed me. Number one, God is as sovereign as his word. Number two, God is limited by his word. And three, God will never violate his word. I will repeat, the reason why we pray is because of these three things. Number one, God is as sovereign as his word. Number two, God is limited by his word. And number three, God will never violate his word. Why are these important? Whenever God speaks, whatever God says becomes law. Not only to creation, but it becomes law also to God. God is sovereign until he speaks. Holy Spirit help us. As long as God doesn't speak, he's sovereign. But when he speaks, he becomes trapped by what he says. This is why God doesn't talk too much. Some of you have been asking God to speak to you and speak to you. And God wouldn't speak to you. Why? Because God knows if I ever speak to her, I got to do it. You'll get it after I'm gone. You'll see. God is limited by what he says. So when God speaks, his sovereignty becomes limited by his words. Why is this so important for you and I? Because prayer was created by the limitations of God's word. Prayer was a strange thing in the New Testament to me. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 11. When I saw this, it changed my life. Luke chapter 11. When I read the, the Gospels, like you probably have many times, I was impressed by the miracles of Jesus. I was impressed by the healing of the blind man, or the raising of the dead child. I was impressed by the walking of, on the water that he did, or the cleansing of lepers. I was impressed by him speaking to trees and they die. I, I was impressed by him uh, uh, breaking bread and fish and feeding thousands of people. I thought that was wonderful. As a matter of fact, I thought if I was with Jesus, and walked with him physically and was with him for those three and a half years uh, I would have asked him teach me how to open the eyes of the blind teach me how to walk on water teach me how to break bread and feed a banquet teach me how to cleanse leprosy with a touch teach me how to do all this massive wonderful magnificent things but do you know the only thing that the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them was to pray. That bothered me. Because you see, I'm like you. I want to be famous. I would tell them, teach me how to walk on water. And then I would call CNN, ABC, and say, come on, today I'm going to show you something. And I'd be on the cover of Time magazine, walking on water in Florida. Or teach me how to cleanse leprosy. Or let me open some blind eyes. Let me do something dynamic that everybody could see. 
They never did. They only asked him to teach them. The only request to teach them was to pray. How come Peter didn't ask them, Jesus, to teach me how to break bread or teach me how to cleanse leprosy? Just teach us how to do this one thing. Pray. And the Bible says, in, Gen in Luke chapter 11, look at verse 1. It says, and after he had finished pr praying in a certain place, then his disciples came to him and asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Just like John taught his disciples. I like the statement in this verse, when he was finished, one of his disciples asked him, in other words, they were watching him from a bush. Can I make a statement that might not do too well with your theology? Jesus never prayed with his disciples. Selah. He always prayed alone. Read your Bible carefully. Whenever it was time to pray, he would say, you stay here. And he'd go off. Why? Because prayer is a personal thing. We love group praying because we don't like to pray. Prayer is a private discipline. It's a personal relationship first. There's nothing wrong with corporate prayer. But that's not your passion. Your passion should be private prayer. We love group prayer meetings because we can get lost in the crowd and don't say anything. Jesus was praying by himself and they were watching him. And when he was finished, the Bible says, they said to him, Master, teach us how to do that. My question to you, which was a question to me also years ago, was why was this the only thing they asked him to teach them? They never asked him to do miracles or to walk on water. They said, just teach us this one thing. Teach us how to do this thing you do. The thing that you do by yourself. The thing we watch you do from behind the bush. Why would they only interested in one thing? Teach us how to pray. I figured it out. Because the disciples finally caught on. Listen carefully. It's what I call inductive and deductive logic. The disciples became smart after a while. Because you see, the Bible would always say this, And Jesus rose up a great time before day and went to a solitary place to pray. Have you ever read that before in your Bible? Yes. Wave at me if you read that before. Good. Now, I'm going to say it again. Listen to it carefully. And a great while before day, Jesus rose up and went to a solitary place alone to pray. When did he do that? A great while before day. Now those of you who probably like me have been to Israel many times, and most of us who have been to the east would know that day in the Middle East begins for those people who go to town and those who take goods to sell to the market. Day can begin around 5 a.m. between 4.30 and 5 a.m. That's when day begin in the east. Matter of fact, day begins with the sunrise. The sun usually rises around 4 a.m. Keep looking at me. He woke up when? A great while before. Which means he must have gotten up by 3 a.m. every morning to pray. And by the time the disciples woke up, he had already finished his entire communication. He prayed at least 3, 4, 5, 6 at least four hours of prayer average every morning and the disciples were amazed every time they woke up they caught him doing this thing and he was doing it every morning for hours and then when he would finish this thing called prayer then he would say let's go to the town and he would go down up the mountain and they would walk into the city and he would do something crazy. He would walk up to a blind man and says, what can I do for you? And the blind man says, I want to see, receive my sight. And he would just say to the man, see. And he would walk off. One fraction of a second, the man's eye was open. He would go to a leper and he would say, what can I do for you? I want to be cleansed. He'd say, 
be clean. And he would walk off. It took about a fraction of a second. Then he walks up to a man who, was, who had a little child that was sick. He says, what's the matter? He says, my child is vexed. He says, no problem. Demon, go. Demon left in a second. Then he walks up to another woman who had a baby going into the, to, to the casket to get buried. He stopped, touched the, the coffin. Live. And the baby lived. Just took a five fraction of a second. And the disciples were watching this. And they said, my goodness, it took him a fraction of a second to do that. And took him four hours in the morning with this other thing. They began to figure it out. They said, look, <laughs> we spent hours trying to cast a demon out. Come out, come out, come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come out, I say. I bind you. I loose you. I loose you. Come on. Now you take over. I'm tired. Okay. I come out. Come on. I loose you. Come out. And for hours, you're trying to cast a demon out. trying to heal the sick, laying on your hands on a person with disease, come out, come out, and he just touched him in a second and left. But he spent four hours in the morning doing this thing. So the disciples conclusion was, if you spend four hours in the morning with God, you'll only spend a minute with men in the day. They were logical. You know what we do? We spend a minute in the morning with God and four hours trying to solve a problem in the day with men. The priority of Jesus was not ministry to men. And there's our problem. See, you can't wait to go heal the sick and go sing and go raise the dead and cast out demons. That's our problem. We can't wait to go then and start a ministry. And God say, no, spend some time with me first. Time in prayer is not time wasted. It's time invested. The disciples figured it out. One time there was a young man that bought his son and the boy was filled with a demon. And the disciples, you know, uh, Jesus, I believe he set it up all by himself. He meant to do it. Jesus set him up. The Bible says he told them, go to the town. And he went to a mountain to pray. I think he set it up. I believe he was watching them from the top of the mountain. He wanted to see if they learned a lesson. And the man bought the boy with the demon. And he says, uh, my son is vexed with a demon. Can you cast him out? And Peter says, no problem, no problem. I'm charismatic. And John said, mm-hmm. And Luke said, mm-hmm. And James said, hot, hot, hot. let's get him. And they began to work on this demon for hours. <laughs> and Jesus was watching. And after they had sweated, was tired, laying out, <laughs> waiting, he said, let me go help him out. And the Bible says, he came down from the mountain and said, what's going on here? <laughs> and the old man says, I brought my son to your disciples with a demon and they could not cast him out. And Jesus said his words, how long must I be with you? In other words, haven't you observed me? Bring the boy to me. Get out. Demon left. They were so ashamed like most of us after praying for 10 hours and no demon left. The Bible said they waited until they were in secret at dinner, quietly behind the wall. And then they said, uh, Master, um, uh, why couldn't we, you know? That's how you feel when you pray for the sick and you walk off and they're still sick. You need to be prepared for ministry. Don't just go and pray for the sick. Prepare yourself to pray for the sick. Why couldn't we?
we do this? He said, simple. This time, this kind only comes out not by shouting, cut out. Not by using the name of Jesus, 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 Jesus. Ah, he said, this kind only comes out after you have prayed, not the person who's sick. And after you have fasted, after you have spent your time with me. I believe this year God wants to do some business on the earth. But he's looking for some people who can do some business with him first. Can I hear an amen somebody? Clap your hands and thank God. He's about to recorrect some things in our lives. Now listen carefully. I want to show you something. And when you get this, this will never be the same for you again. My question was why did Jesus have such a committed prayer life? Because he understood what I call the birth of prayer. When was prayer born? Prayer was born in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I'm going to show you the birth of prayer. Turn there. Two words gave birth to prayer. It's found in Genesis 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. And then God says, let them have dominion over the earth. Let them. Oh, I wish he hadn't said that. Remember, when God speaks, his words become law. God said, let them have dominion over the fish, the birds, the trees, and over the earth, and everything that creeps upon the ground and over all the earth. Let them. Everybody say, let them. Amen. Say it loud. Amen. It's the most powerful statement concerning prayer that you can ever learn. God says, let them have dominion over the earth. Let them dominate the earth. I wish God had said, let us have dominion. If he had said, let us have dominion, then he would have included himself. But he didn't. He said, let them have dominion. Them who? Them man. Man who? Them mankind. What is a, a man? A man is a strange creature. Because in Genesis chapter 1, God created man. In chapter 2, he made the body of man and then he put the man inside the body the man the word man actually is the name God gave to the spirit being and then God gave the spirit being an assignment that was physical and you know spirits can't appreciate physical things so God had to create a earth suit for the spiritual man and so therefore God took the man and put him inside the earth body Genesis 2 verse 8 and therefore God made a man in a spirit body in a physical house that's what a human is a human is two words put together it's humus Man. Humus means dirt. Man means spirit. Put the man inside the dirt. It's called a humus man. We call it human. A human is a mystery. A human is a spirit being in a dirt body. In other words, a human being is an integration of physical and spiritual. You are a spirit, but you live in a body. Your body is humus. That's dirt. But you are man. That's spirit. So when God put us in the body, humus, he put man in humus, and therefore we became a humus man or a human. And it is that creature that God said, let them have dominion over the earth. Therefore the only creature, here's the key, that has legal authority on earth is a human. The only creature that God said, have dominion, dominate the earth, is a human. What is a human? A spirit in a body. That means any spirit without a body is illegal on planet earth. Follow me carefully. Therefore, in order for God to get anything done on earth, He has to obey His own word. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, God says, I have placed my word above my name. You know, the Hebrew word for name also means being, to be. In Hebrew, the name of a thing is the thing. So when God says, I place my word above my name, he's saying, I place my word above myself. I will not break my own word. I will not violate my own word. As a matter of fact, that's what makes God so faithful. He keeps his word, not only to you, but to himself. That's why he said, even if you are unholy, I must be holy still, even to myself. God will never violate His word. That's why God, listen carefully, cannot come into this planet without a body.
Not because he's weak, not because he is not powerful, not because he's not mighty, but because he's too faithful to his word. He will never break his word. God will not come to this earth as a spirit without a body. Because he spoke and it became law. Only a few will understand me, I know that. Therefore, if anything is going to be done on earth, legally, it has to be done by a spirit with a body. That's why Adam and Eve, when they were about to pick the fruit, God could not interfere. Because God is what? Spirit. <laughs> Eve was a weak woman, a little creature that he created, but he couldn't stop her. Why? Because if God had come in and invaded the human race as a spirit without a body, he would have broken his word and therefore you could never trust him again. And Satan knew that. That's why even the devil knew to do business on earth you need a body and there was no room for him in Adam and Eve. So he went to a snake and negotiated to use his dirt body and the snake gave him a dirt body and Lucifer took on that dirt body and did business with Eve and therefore God knew I cannot stop them because if I stop them as a spirit then I'll become a liar and God is not a liar. But when Adam and Eve fell, God is such a good God. God said to Satan, Genesis 3 verse 15, he says, Satan, paraphrase, you know I can't come in right now, but you used to live with me. You know I keep my word. But I'll make you a promise, Lucifer. I promise you that the same woman that you use to destroy the human, the same woman, I'm going to come into her legally. She's going to give me a body legally. I'm going to come into the earth legally. I'm going to crush your head legally. That was the promise. Christmas was necessary because of God's word. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Born of what? A woman. Isaiah said, you ain't believe my report, but I saw something he says. I saw a virgin with child. And the name of the child was Im, man, you, El. Im means in. Man means mankind. El means Elohim. He says, I saw God inside a man, a human body. I can understand it, but God's coming in here legally. He's going to take back the power legally. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm getting ready to stop now. Hang on a second. And so when God came to, 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 to Mary, he said, Mary, you're highly favored. Why? I want to borrow your womb. Why? I want to be legal. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mary said, be it unto me. Just like you said. Spoon. And the word of God dropped into a womb. And the flesh began to grow around the word. And now God is inside a womb. But many of you women don't understand how powerful you are. Because in Genesis 3 verse 15, God told Satan about the woman. He said, the woman will be your nightmare. I used to wonder why. Now you medical doctors here know this to be true. You see, God, when he was designing the female, he designed her really for him. The woman's body is designed in such a way that the womb of a woman is designed to produce a child, but the child's blood never mixes with the mother's blood. God designed it that way. He was thinking about himself. <laughs> you see, when a child is in a woman's womb, no matter what blood type the child has, it never mixes with the mother's blood, completely separate. That means a woman can carry a baby and the two never mix. Oh, you don't understand yet. So God said, Satan, I got you. I've made arrangements to come into the human race. That woman shall bear me a seed. And the blood will not mix with hers. It's going to be genuine God blood. Woo! It ain't going to mix with hers. And that seed is going to come into the earth legally. And it's going to have a blood that's going to be so pure. It'll be able to cleanse everybody. Y'all shout hallelujah for the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ had God's DNA. The 
chromosome combination was Elohim and Adonai mixed together. Y'all better shout God for the blood. That's why the Bible says you are saved by the blood of Jesus. His blood was not Mary's blood. Matter of fact, Mary got saved by the blood she was carrying. Shout hallelujah, somebody. Hey, glory to God. And he said, Mary, you shall call the child, watch this, Jesus. Isaiah said in chapter 9, he said, for unto us a child is born and a son is given. Now the child was born, but the son wasn't. <laughs> uh, Mary born the child, but God gave the son. Mary produced the body, God gave the spirit. Mary produced the house, God gave the resident. In other words, Mary is, is the mother of Jesus, but she ain't the mother of Christ. I'm going right now. Jesus is the body. Christ is God. That's why he's called Jesus the Christ. Because Jesus made Christ legal. <laughs> That's why Jesus could pray on earth. He was legal. God cannot interfere on earth without a human. What is prayer? I define it this way. Prayer is man giving God license to interfere in planet earth. I'm going to try it one more time. I say prayer is God receiving license from man to interfere in planet earth. If you read the Bible carefully, now this is a lot of heavy stuff for you guys, but go do your homework for 2003. I want you to find anywhere in the Bible, anywhere where God did anything in the earth without a human. Whenever God wanted to act in the earth, he had to use someone in dirt. God don't use you because you are pure. He uses you because he's trapped. That's why God keeps forgiving. He needs your body. God keeps cleansing you. What? He needs you. God says, Abraham, I've had enough of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to destroy them. Abraham said, but why come to me? <laughs> God, I, 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 I need a human. I need someone to give me permission. And Abraham made a deal with God. And he kept dealing. And God had to cooperate with the deal. Then Abraham says, okay, Lord us out and I'll go for it. God said, thank you very much. And he destroyed it. He said, Moses, I have heard the cries of my people. I have come down to deliver them. So why come to me? Because you're a man, Moses. I need permission. <laughs> you get it after I'm gone. Tell your neighbor, God needs me to impact my city. Say it again, God needs me to impact my city. Prayer is not an option. It's a necessity. The theme of this conference is supernatural interference. And the only way for God to interfere supernaturally is he needs a human. And Jesus said, men ought always to pray and never faint. Here's one you know well, but finally you'll understand it. And Jesus said, I have given you the keys of the kingdom. Then he says, here they are. Whatever you bind on earth, then heaven could bind and whatever you loose on earth then now heaven could loose it your body is the most important thing to God right now that's why when you lose it you have to leave When your body stops working, you have to leave. Because you are now illegal. 
Matter of fact, God is so committed to your body, He has provided a program called healing. God's going to heal you tonight because He needs your body, not because He wants to make you feel better. Y'all don't understand healing. I say God's going to restore you tonight physically, not because He wants you to feel good, but because He needs the body you're living in. Lift your hands and thank God He's going to heal you for His sake. That's why many people don't get healed. They come to get healed because they want to be better. They want to feel better. They want to be better. But don't pray for that. Say, Lord, heal me because you need my body. Come on, shout amen, somebody. Your body is important to God. See, Christ is a spirit and he is illegal here without a body. So the Bible never says that Jesus really died. The word it used in the Greek is, he expired. He blew. He released Christ. And then Jesus died. Christ never died, only Jesus. So the Bible says, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of Christ, shall also raise your mortal body. Listen to me carefully. And so Jesus was on the cross, dead. Christ went down into Gehenna and Sheol through Hades. Walked into the dungeons of darkness. Kicked open the door of depression. He saw Lucifer on a throne reigning by bluff. And Christ walked up to, to Lucifer and says, I come to pick up some things. And Lucifer says, you can't come down here. You gotta be dead to come down here. And Christ says, I'm dead. My body's upstairs. He kept on walking. Lucifer said, well, you can't come here. Only sin can kill a man. And Christ says, that body upstairs is filled with all of their sin. That's what killed it. I come for something. He walks up to Lucifer. He put his hands in his belt. And he put his hands on three keys. And he checked them. Death, hell, grave. He pulled them. <laughs> I'm getting ready to sit down right now. His robe fell off. And he was naked. And Christ turned around and says, I'll be back. And he walked off with the keys of death, hell and the grave. He kicked open the door of dungeons. He opened the cells of those who were lost and bound for the years. He says, come on Abraham, come on Joseph, come on Moses, come on Jacob, come on Esau, come on, get behind me. And the Bible says he led captives in his train and he arose. He took them up to paradise, deposited them before the Father. And he said, I'm not finished yet. I got to go back down to earth. I can hear Gabriel say, but well, you can't go down there because you ain't got no body. And then he says, I got one on ice. Come on, somebody. And Christ came back down to earth, went inside the body of Jesus. He came back and Jesus said, thank you very much. I thought you forgot me. He says, no, here we go. Kicked open the door of that dungeon, walked out resurrected power. He meets his disciples, he says, now I gotta go. Jesus has finished his job, he has to go. The same Jesus, who you see leaving, he will come back someday. But, I will come back immediately. <sighs> yeah, but you ain't got no body, Christ. Christ, you are illegal. You have no body. <laughs> and Christ said, I made arrangements. I got a body, but this time it's not two hands and two legs and two eyes. It's millions of hands, millions of legs. I still got a body. That's why the church is never called the body of Jesus. Lift your hand up right now. Stand up on your feet. Tell your neighbor he needs my body to be legal on earth. Lift your hand and say right now I give you permission to invade my nation. No, you ain't praying like you believe it. Come on, say it. I give you permission through my body, through my faith, 
to invade the nation. Go ahead and worship right now. He's doing it right now. That's what prayer is all about. Whatever you bind on earth, heaven can now bind. Whatever you loose on earth, heaven can now loose. The power is in your hands. Excuse me, I'm beginning to feel some communication going on on the inside. I'm talking to my unseen father. Listen to me. If you are sick tonight, high blood pressure, diabetes, conditions of the heart, eye problems, knee problems, I don't know what it is. Lift your hands right now. God's going to heal you, but not because you want to feel better. He's going to heal you because he needs that body to get some work done. Now some of you think you ain't sick. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you're sick but you ain't know it yet. So just in case, lift your hands and receive this healing. I'm going to release right now in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray a sabotage prayer. A sabotage prayer is a prayer which attacks disease before you knew it was there. <laughs> See some of y'all got high blood pressure but don't even know it yet. Some of you got hernias, but don't know it yet. Some of you got prostate cancer, but you don't know it yet. But tonight, I guarantee you, you'll never know it because God's going to heal it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lift your hands and receive your healing right now. Open your mouth and tell him, heal me for your sake. Come on, ask him. Heal me for your sake. Heal me for your sake. I must live long for your sake. You need my body for your sake. You need to be legal, so you need me, Lord. You need my body. <laughs> Go ahead and praise Him. Something's happening. I see miracles happening all over the building. I see eyes being healed of cataracts. Yeah, that back is coming back into order. Yeah, I see that hip joint being recreated. Yeah, I see that knee joint, the cartilage being restored. Yes, I see that shoulder problem being recorrected. Yeah, prostate cancer is dissolving in the name of Jesus. The lump in your breast, check it out. It's gone already in the name of Jesus. When you ask God to interfere, He does it because you are a human. Open your mouth and thank God. You just got totally healed right now. Lift your voice and praise Him for the healing you just received. Hold hands together. Let's pray. Korama, I feel an anointing flowing in this building. Let's pray in tongues for a second. Your neighbor is being healed right before your eye. Touch him right now. Wherever any two shall touch and agree concerning anything where? On earth. Then it shall be done. Of our Father who's where? In heaven. But you got to first what? Touch and agree where? On earth. Then heaven can do something. But earth got to touch and agree first. You got more power than you think you have. Oh, I wish I had more time to teach you this thing. I got to go, but I'm telling you, it's so powerful. From now on, every time you open your mouth to pray, you are powerful. When man stops praying, God stops working. I'm going to say it again. When man stops praying, God has to stop working. So Jesus said, men ought always to pray and never stop. Why? When you stop, God stops. Pray without ceasing. Because you don't want heaven to stop working in the earth. I challenge you from this night forward. Stop depending on intercessors. Become one yourself. So the earth could be changed. Because I finally figured out. Jesus said, my father always hears me. What a way to live. From this night forward, it shall happen to you in the name of Jesus. Your prayers will now be answered because now you know how valuable you are to God. I feel an anointing of God in this building for prayer. I want you right now to think of a scripture to pray over your city right now. Whatever that scripture is. Whatever you bind on earth, heaven can bind. 
I want you to bind the spirit of violence in your city. The, bind the spirit of rape, the spirit of thievery, the spirit of corruption, the spirit of, of malpractice. Think about all those demon spirits, those, those spirits that are hovering over your city, the principalities. You got the power to bind them. The Bible says angels will do the bidding of those who are heirs of salvation. They are waiting for you to tell them what to do. Lift your hand now and speak over your city. Tell those spirits they are illegal. They have no bodies. Cast them down. They have no bodies. They are illegal. You got the body. You're the one with the legal power. You can cast every legal spirit, illegal spirit out of your city. Every principality, every power in the name of Jesus. Come down tonight. Come down tonight. Come down in the name of Jesus. Come down. I come against the spirit of terrorism, you foul demons of fear. I bind you on earth. You have no right here. Get off this planet in the... Come on, y'all help me out. Get off this planet, you foul spirit of fear and terrorism and lies and corruption and violence. Get out of our city in the name of Jesus. It's the power you have as your body. You will not die. God ain't finished working through your body yet. Now lift your hands and begin to raise up a shout of triumph. Something just happened in the spirit world tonight. Act like something happened tonight. Come on. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Shout to the Lord. Oh, I had enough. Praise God. Come on, praise Him.